For 11 years, I have gone on and on that we don't buy cars, we buy stories. And admittedly, some cars have better stories than others. So why don't we put the new cars off to the side, at least for this week, and see if we can find a better story. Okay, so first things first, not exactly like starting a modern day car. Then again, it's not like starting a Model T, it's somewhere in between. I would argue with the couple of steps that are involved, it's more like wings of the Luftwaffe. Uh, that said, step one, clutch in. Step two, double check we got the parking brake on. Uh, in neutral here. Now it's a very warm day, it's 82 degrees out. Uh, and I've been driving the car for a bit, so I don't need to pull the choke. If it was cold, you would need to. Uh, then the next step is to turn the ignition on. Notice the car doesn't start. Now this is mechanical fuel injection. So that means you need to create pressure into the fuel injection system. You do that with a separate mechanical pump. You need to switch that on from here. Now you can hear that pump. Uh, then once we feel there's a little bit of fuel in there, we push in and she starts right up. Amazing how reliable this thing is, how many years on. Okay, now that the car is running, we don't need the fuel pump anymore. And with that, shall we? I would say this is going to be a good day at the office. Okay, that's flat out. It's got some acceleration. Now, keep in mind, acceleration from back in 1955. I would argue even in today's day and age, this thing, I wouldn't call it quick, but it can keep up with modern day traffic and it can be a handful in terms of acceleration on a track, which this particular car has spent a lot of time on. That being the case, let's push her a little harder because she really starts to wake up around 4,000 RPM. Amazing that an inline six from really the late 40s in design can do this in 2020. God, this thing is magnificent. There is a dirty little secret about this car that most people in today's day and age seem to forget. Here is an inline three liter six cylinder engine that produced more power than most V8s of its day. And yes, there is an interesting story there. And no, it did not technically come from a race car. Yes, there was the W194, which was from 1952 and very winning race car. That also had a three liter inline six, but that was carbureted. This is an entirely different kettle of fish. You see, when the Mercedes engineers were envisioning what really is a race car for the streets, they wanted to up the output. So they enlisted the help of Bosch to graft on a mechanical fuel injection system. This was otherworldly space technology back then, and it upped the output by 50%. But this also was really the first car that offered fuel injection to the masses. Granted, this is a very expensive car, so I really wouldn't call it offered to the masses, but still a first. Then there was a major problem about packaging. You see, this engine really came from the Adenauer luxury car, a very large car, as well as the 300S coupe. So how do you package it in a very small car with a low hood? Well, the first trick was to diagonally tilt the engine towards the driver, which lowered in the car, got underneath the hood. And then something that I would argue is almost as important as the fuel injection system, and that is a dry sump lubrication system. As a basis of comparison, most cars today don't have a dry sump lubrication system. At that, the ones we see that have it are $200,000 Porsche 911 turbos and GT3s. And then there's something quaint here. When was the last time you saw a glass jar underneath the hood of a car? So uh, back in the day, there was really no such thing as a six-speed manual. Pretty horse, wow, what a wonderful color. Uh, but there were four speeds. Uh, these were kind of like having a seven-speed and a 911 today. They were mainly reserved for high-performance applications, like Jaguar had them, high-performance American cars had them. This is a unique case in that first gear is very low, like you could pull tree stumps with first gear. But then there was second gear, and this is one of the more usable gears because it's so wide. 
Uh, you can use it around turns, you can use it to putter around town without going too fast. Like I hear I'm about 30 miles an hour, and it's not really stressing the engine. Uh, third gear is similar, also very, very wide. Uh, this is for higher speed cruising, I would say around town. And then there's fourth, and here we need to remember the car's top speed, 163 miles an hour, which is otherworldly back in 1955. And that's why this needed to be a very tall fourth gear. And I would argue you really wouldn't be using this under 40, 45 miles an hour. Really, you would need to punch this thing out to be above 55, 60 to have any kind of usability in fourth gear, which ain't a bad thing. Kubo and I have a sneaking suspicion that most car guys and gals know the history of this, the 300 SL, otherwise known as the W198, very well. However, let's still touch on some of the high points. This was the brainchild of Mercedes-Benz, but more importantly, an Austrian immigrant by the name of Max Hoffman, better known to those who worked with him as Maxi. He had a car dealership in New York City, and he introduced Americans, wealthy Americans, to very cool cars from Europe. So in 1952, he saw an incredibly cool car, the Mercedes W194, which was a very winning race car. So he goes to the factory in Stuttgart and says, hey man, Let's build a couple of these things and sell them to these rich Americans. And they're like, great idea, but we're not interested. Then he got his checkbook out and ordered a thousand of them. That's when the factory took them seriously. So seriously, they didn't introduce the car, meaning the road version, this one, in Europe. They introduced it at the New York Auto Show to drum up interest from Americans. And there was a lot of interest. So much so, they sold about 1,400 coupes and 1,848 Roadsters. So it was kind of a staggered introduction. The coupes, 54 to 57, this is a 55, and the uh, Roadsters, 57 to 63. But interestingly, it was the second year where most of the coupes that were made, they made something like almost 850 of them in the second year, 55, this year here. Now let's press on to two lesser known fun facts. These were manufactured at Mercedes Sindelfingen plant, which is where they currently manufacture the S-Class. I don't know about you guys, but Kumo and I find it very interesting that the plant that they made the best car they had in 1955 is still making the best car they make in 2020. And the number two, Bob Lutz, our, our most frequent inside the Motorman studio guest. He worked with Maxi Hoffman when Bob was at BMW and shared some interesting stories about working directly with Maxi Hoffman and the stories on bringing BMW to the US. So click on this link above and you too can watch Bob share stories about Maxi Hoffman himself. For those of you that are familiar with the Roadster version of the W198, yes, those had disc brakes. Uh, gull wings, not so much. Factory gull wings had drum brakes. Let's give those things a try here. Uh, but not a complete panic stop like you normally do with new cars because it ain't my car. So with that, here we go. Um, not quite what you'd expect of the Roadster. And that's part of the reason why the Roadsters are better driving cars. And given the limitations of the brakes, it makes you gain so much more respect for the people who race these professionally for Mercedes-Benz, as well as the privateers, that they were able to get these things at, what is it, 163 miles an hour is top speed on this? And driving this at that speed with these brakes. Granted, they aren't the brakes that were on a blue flame Chevy, but wow, hats off to the drivers back in the day, or even the people who track these things now. And now, the piece de resistance, the doors. Uh, contrary to popular opinion, these are not a design-led feature. This is more a form follows function kind of a thing. You see, if I were to show you this car naked, it would look something very similar to a Maserati birdcage, just not as advanced, in that it has a tubular frame that sits on top of a steel chassis with a mainly steel body. The hood, the dash, the doors, and the boot lid are all aluminum. There were 29 of them manufactured with an all aluminum body, very expensive option back in the day, and now significantly more valuable on a classic car market. However, back to the doors and that tubular frame. Uh, when you think about how it surrounds the passenger compartment, it comes up high to increase the structure of the vehicle. So there's really no way to put on a door that goes low in order to aid in ingress and egress. So the engineers came up with this solution, which has proven to be very iconic, but there was an unintended benefit in that you look at the frontal area of the car, 
And look at how much more narrow the passenger compartment is, which in the W194 helped that car, remember, that didn't have the fuel injected engine, win many races because A, it was lighter, and B, more aerodynamic. And C, in a time when there were really no wind tunnels to test this kind of stuff. So one of the complaints about the Goldwing in particular, both back in the day as well as today, wow, does it get hot in here. Uh, basically, your air conditioning is limited to these two vent windows. This is full max AC. Uh, and these, this little pin comes out here, so you can take these windows out, but that's mainly for racing. You really wouldn't do that. Uh, but there is a solution, and the solution is pull over. And hopefully you do this in a scenic spot, and you have a view or a window onto the world. Now, didn't I start this episode by saying this would be an incredibly good day at the office? Not only do we have one of the most iconic classic cars of all time, a stunning view on a beautiful day down into Los Angeles, as well as the beaches on the Pacific Ocean. No, it is not indeed time to play our favorite game, the options game. Instead, it is time to play an entirely new game, Options Game Senior. And that's where we take classic cars like this, and if I have the available information of what the car costs new, including the options, we go through those numbers, and then we compare it with the information from our good friend, Dave Kinney, who literally writes the book on classic car values to find out what the car is worth today. So without further ado, let's jump right into the 1955 Mercedes-Benz 300 SL Gullwing for a base price in its homeland of 29,000 Deutsche Mark, or in the US, $6,820. To that, we add the blue paint. Now this car did not start life as blue, it started as black, but back in the day, the only color you got for free was silver, which explains why you see most of them as silver. Uh, but if you paid $65, you can get a color other than metallic silver. Uh, this car is fitted with the windscreen washers. That's $18. Uh, just as a side note, you could get a Becca radio for this thing. $264. The original owner of this cheaped out. Then there's the leather upholstery for the coupe. This one was born with leather upholstery. That was an additional $165. I would argue you didn't want the leather because it came with the check seats and you look at them today with the check seats and it, yes, I am an Anglophile, I've lived in England and I love British cars, but in this it looks even better. So much so the owner of this particular car is going to change the seats to the check seats. I'll have to put the pictures up on Instagram when he does. Uh, then there's the fitted luggage, a very desirable option. This car came from the factory with the fitted luggage, $85. And that was a function of there was no trunk space. Even though there's a trunk, it's basically a fuel cell. So you had to get the fitted luggage to kind of fit behind the seats. Uh, there was an unusual option. I don't know if this car had it. Uh, for $80, you could have the factory crate the entire car for shipment over the ocean. Only 80 bucks. You couldn't get a car company today to do that. And then another very important option that this car was fitted with from the factory was the competition camshaft. Very important because uh, the owner of this car actually tracks it. He really races this car, $73. Then the most important option is the Rudge wheels. Think of this as like a knockoff wheel for racing or like today you look at GT3s with single lugs, that's what this is. Uh, most cars didn't come with the Rudge wheels. There's a lot more cars today that have the Rudge wheels, but they're not factory Rudge cars, which makes a difference according to Dave. We'll get to that in a bit. Now, we get to the total price. Back in 1955 was $7,576. Adjusted for inflation, $72,900. That is a bargain when you consider that the replacement for this car, if you can consider the AMG GTC, the replacement, the last one you and I drove was about 150 grand, so they've doubled in price since 1955. But now, let's find out what Dave says this is worth today, and if it were a condition for a car, meaning a bucket of bolts that don't run, it'd be worth the paltry $965,000. However, if it were a garage queen, Concord level restoration, it'd be worth $1.5. $4 million. This, it's more of a condition two car, good one at that, because it's been really well cared for, but it's got great history because the guy's gone wheel to wheel with this thing. It's been on the Italian Millier, uh, Colorado Grand, and many others, uh, calls it for $1.3 million. But wait, 
there's more. Remember the luggage that we paid $85 for? That's worth an additional $20,000. And then the Rudge wheels, which we paid almost 5% of the car's base price for. If it were a real Rudge wheel car, which this is, it adds an additional $50,000. So conservatively, considering the condition, the options it has, and the ownership history, I'd say this one's probably worth about 1.5. Steering, it's a bit of a mixed bag. It requires you to be a much, whoa, that was fun. It requires you to be a much more active participant, but God, the way the thing is set up, it makes the car so tail happy. I will say it makes you think back. Imagine if you were one of the privateers back in the day when this thing was only $6,000, or better yet, you worked for the Mercedes racing team. Imagine if you could slide this thing to your heart's content without a care in the world. So let's dive into the history of this specific Owing serial ending 040. It was purchased 20 years ago at RM's New York Waldorf Astoria sale. There, in reality, it was a no sale, but the owner, he did a deal with Rob Meyer, ended up getting the car. And the whole logic was, he already had a Roadster, which is not a car you can race. He wanted this because he wanted to go wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing with a goal win. Uh, the car already had a full restoration prior to that, so didn't need to restore it, but did send the car to a Mark expert to get it ready for racing and then started campaigning the car very heavily. So much so that he got so into this car, sold his Roadster, got another Roadster, and then once again got into this car, sold that Roadster, and then really campaigned this thing. It's been on the Italian Mille, it's been on the Colorado Grand, it's been on other Colorado Grand type events around the U.S., and here's something that's really interesting. A lot of cars like this, of this kind of value, they sit. People drive them maybe on the weekends, maybe with their wives, the proverbial, take their kids for ice cream, although I would never put ice cream in this car. This car had something like 30,000 original miles when he bought it. It now has 106,000 original miles. So he has put 76,000 miles on one of the most quintessential classic cars, which it's kind of funny. If you look at uh, Sports Car Market from 2000, when he bought this car, they did put it in the report for that sale. And in the end, I don't know who wrote the report, whether it was Dave, Donald Osborne, or Keith Martin, but they said, here's a perfect Concorde level car. Let's see if the owner actually drives it. Well, Keith, Dave, or Donald, or whoever wrote it, I'm happy to tell you, the owner drives it and drives the hell out of it. Here we go.